Okay, Shabbat Shalom. All right, if you got a show far, Shabbat Shalom, Shema Yisrael, Shabbat Shalom, Facebook. If you, got a sh if you have a shofar, let's go ahead and grab it and uh, blow the shofar with me before we begin um, the message today. Amen. <coughs> All right, well, let's, let's open up in a word of prayer. Avinu in heaven, Hashem Yehovah, Father, we thank you for your Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for your only son, Yehovah, our Yeshua, our Savior and our Master and our King. Father, we thank you for this set-apart time. We thank you for being able to gather together here today with our Mishpaha. Father, we pray that you would be with me, the messenger, today. Father, touch the cold to my lips. May your words be my words. Father, help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear. And may nothing come out of my lips that is not from you. May it fall straight to the ground. May it not even come through my lips. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be with each and every one listening, each and every one here today, each and every one listening via Facebook and Internet and those who will be listening later on. Father, give us all your wisdom and knowledge and understanding of your, <clears throat> of your entire word from Genesis to Revelation. <clears throat> and may you be honored and glorified and magnified. In the precious name of Yehovah Yeshua, we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Thou shalt not steal, commandment number eight. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 15. Been making my way through the, through the Ten Commandments. And then today I will be teaching on Thou shalt not steal, Exodus 20, 15. Pretty clear, cut, and dry. But first of all, I want to turn to 2 Timothy 2, 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to Elohim, a worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth something that i've started in the last couple three messages that i've done um i tell everybody don't take my word for it take everything that i say every verse of scripture every word that comes out of my lips take it back to the word of yehovah do not take my word for it i am a man we serve the perfect creator yehovah yeshua and his father which is in heaven take it back to him pray about it and decide for yourself what the word of Yah says. <clears throat> With that being said, Exodus 20, 15, thou shalt not steal. In Romans chapter 13, verses 7 through 9. <clears throat> Romans 13, verse number 7. Render therefore all your to all their due. Therefore, to all their due, taxes whom taxes are due, customs who, whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to honor. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves one another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up into this, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does, no, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. <clears throat> do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Don't covet their stuff. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. The Hebrew word for thou shalt not steal is H, 1589. Lo ganab. Lo in Hebrew means no. No stealing. And the definition of it means to steal, to carry away. It, it occurs 39 times in the KJV. It is also steal by stealth, thievery. More often than not, thievery happens at night. And in the Greek, it is G2813, klepto, commit theft, to take away by stealth. And it has occurred 13 times in the KJV. Secretly stealing. Most stealing happens at night. 
in the dark where nobody can see you. But I tell you what, Yah sees everything. Nothing is behind his eyes. Nothing you do or say can be hidden from Elohim. We always hear of stealing. We always hear of thievery happening at night. Uh, banks being robbed. People's houses being broke into and stuff being stolen. Why? Because it's dark. Sin always happens more generally than not in the dark where, where they think that people can't see them. But today I'm going to show you many examples where more often, more often it happens right before our eyes. <coughs> and not just at night, but during the day. And every step that we take, we have to be well aware of what we are doing and where we are going and be very aware on the path that we are following. Like I said, nothing is hidden from Yehovah, not at day or not at night. Now I'm going to ask the congregation here, give me some types of stealing. Um, like from stores? Yep, stealing from stores. I kind of want to bring that up because I never steal out here, but I've got myself caught in uh, poverty. I got a lot of problems at home, and to be honest, I shouldn't have money, and I got real problems. So, so, so stealing from grocery stores is bad. Is exactly. Okay, give me another type of stealing. Tax evasion. Okay, tax evasion. That's one I didn't have down. Yeah. Stealing, stealing from the government. Remember, remember, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. We live in America. We have to pay taxes. Pay your taxes. Don't steal from the government, even though they might be stealing from you in one way or another. <laughs> Still don't steal from them because we serve the living creator. We serve Yehovah Yeshua. And we have to provide all things honest in the sight of man and in the sight of Yehovah. And remember, we have to answer to Yah before we have to answer to man. Taking a borrow, or borrowing without asking? Borrowing without asking is stealing, yes. <clears throat> yes, Samuel. Stealing from banks. Stealing from banks, yes. Stealing, stealing money. Yep, stealing money, whether it's mommy and daddy's or the church's money. Do you think, uh, or, just a second, John. Yeah, whether it's stealing from mommy and daddy, stealing from church, stealing from your brother or sister, stealing from anybody, it's wrong. Anybody else? Uh, stealing time. Um, stealing time. I yep. I have, I have a real internal problem with, like I'm native, I'm half native and half white. And I have no problem with Jesus or this church, but I've been to the wire when it's freezing outside and nobody's around. And you know, you go to the ark and you might take something, <coughs> but it's donated. I mean, I know that they have to make their money, but I'm just saying there's that fine line. You know what I mean? If, if uh, North America gets cold, and I've noticed that, you know, it's uh, it just, that's kind of an issue with me. It's kind of like, you know what I mean? Just make sure your needs are met. Just make sure your needs are met. Yeah, yeah. It makes me feel bad to God, though. You're yep. right. And God, God, will always, God will always provide, but nothing will ever go against the Word of God. Make sure you line yourself up You're with right. the Word of God. Yeah. Miss Karen. Uh, stealing from God with our tithes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll touch on that one, too. You guys are, you guys are doing good. Um, and basically, everything that I had, <clears throat> everything that I had written down, as you guys said, so first off, let's turn to Matthew 6, 24. <clears throat> no one can serve two masters, for, he will, for, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. First off, pastors, shepherds. Shepherds of the sheep, you cannot serve Yehovah and you cannot serve the God of money. First Timothy six ten. <clears throat> First Timothy six ten. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves 
through with many sorrows. Pastors that you hear about, big name preachers, um, I'm not going to name any names. Everybody knows who they are, but they're in it for the money. They're not in it. They're in it for the glory, for their fame. Their treasures are here on earth. <clears throat> big name preachers that you, that go around all over the United States, all over the world, they're about their own agenda. They're not about the agenda of, of Yehovah Yeshua. They're preaching a false doctrine. They love money. They charge to pray over people. They, um, I know one website that I've seen um, you can give, and Miss Gale has heard it and seen it too, that if you give a like 30 or $50 a month, you get X amount of prayers for each month. That's robbing from God and that's robbing from people. You're robbing the blessings from those people because, oh, if you pay me, I'll, I'll pray for you. Prayer is free and you're stealing from those people. Those pastors are stealing from those, from those, uh, from those people. And they're using it for their glory. And they're using it for their glory and building their mansions and building, building their name instead of humbling and submitting themselves under, under Yehovah Yeshua and um, doing, doing what they're commanded to do. They're living for themselves. So you will either love Yehovah, Ye Yehovah Yeshua, or else you will love the God of this world, which is Hasatan. And many categories fall underneath of there. First Timothy six verses three through ten. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent the wholesome words, even the words of our Adon Yeshua Messiah, and the doctrine which which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments. Otherwise, other words, from which come envy, strife, reveling, evil suspicions useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from from such withdraw yourself get away from them do not go near unto them verse number six now godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out and having food and clothing with these we shall be content but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men for destruction and perdition and once again verse number 10 for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed after the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows it points back to Matthew 6, 24 through 34. We'll go there right quick and read that. That way we all get the, the gist of what's being said here. Matthew 6, 24. <coughs> no one can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds in the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to a stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies in the field, how they grow. Ne they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if Elohim so clothes the grass in the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall ye eat, and what shall ye drink, or what shall ye wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things, but seek first the kingdom of Elohim and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Being a godly person and being content with what you have, my wife was doing a Bible study this morning about being content with the things that you have. You know, if you got food, you got clothing, you got shelter, and you got medicine, what more is there? What? Philippians 4.19. Okay, let's go ahead and turn to Philippians 4.19. <coughs> Sorry. Philippians 
since it goes right along. We'll have that one written down right there. Ephesians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians 4.19. And my L shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Yeshua Messiah. Have no need to worry. Seek first the kingdom of Yehovah and his righteousness. Be obedient to the Father in heaven and he will supply all your need. Um, verse number nine. In uh, being a godly person and being content with what you have is good. But the rich people. But the rich do they want they always want more and they will do anything and everything in the world. They will seek to kill, to destroy, just to gain another dollar. They will do whatever they can to make themselves the richest person in the world. They will lust after money, they will covet after money. And that gets into commandment number ten. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or covet thy neighbor's things. That'll be in a that'll be here after a little while. But they want to steal to get to fulfill their heart's desires. Isaiah 56, verses 9 through 12. <coughs> Isaiah 56, verse number 9. All you beasts come to the field, come to devour. All you beasts in the forest, his watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yes, they are, they are greedy dogs, which never have enough. And they are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his own gain, from his own territory. Come, one says, I, I will bring wine and we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will be as today, and much more abundant. That sounds like a lot of rich people today, doesn't it? Sounds like a lot of those rich pastors who want to fill themselves. They don't care about people. They just want their money. They want to steal their money from not only you, but they want to get it from people. And they steal it for themselves to buy big fancy houses, big fancy airplanes, big fancy cars. They don't care about the homeless. All they care about is filling their treasuries down here on earth with gold, with silver, and making sure that they're, they're full to their heart's desires. <coughs> the cash goes to them. Um, the church that we used to attend, our old pastor, he, uh, he never touched the books. He never counted the money because more, more times than not, um, people in the church will, <clears throat> people of the church will um, lie to get a pastor in trouble if they don't like him. Oh, you, you stole that money. You counted the money. Well, where'd this go? Where'd that go? Um, there's also been instances where the past, if the, I've heard of different pastors say if there has been cash coming in to an offering box, oh, that, that's free will, that goes in my pocket, and they stuff it in their pocket. That doesn't get counted in the, in the tithe box. That, that gets put in their pocket. Abstain from all appearance of evil. They, they have multiple checking accounts, <clears throat> so they can funnel money here and funnel money there. And uh, I've even heard a pastor say that if the feds knew what we did with the church's finances, we would all be in prison. Yeah. So if that's not stealing from man and stealing from Yah, then, then I don't know what is. <clears throat> and where the church we came from, I was the um, treasury's assistant. And uh, there was always two men, either a deacon and the treasurer, or the deacon and the assistant, which was myself, we always had two men. We always had an accountability partner. So everybody knew that, okay, this is what we got. This is where it went. This is how much we're spending here, there, and there. Every penny was accounted for. Uh, pastors, teachers, preachers, leaders, listen up. First Timothy 3. Uh, I've read the first 10 verses. Let's read the next six. Or 
or wait, 1 Timothy 3, I apologize. Let's do all 16. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop that must be blameless, the husband of one wife. That doesn't mean one at a time. That means one all the time. Temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrel, quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how can he take care of the church of El? Not a novice, and a novice is a new believer. Yah's not going to take a newly repented man and put him in the pulpit the next week. That's what a novice is, is a newly repented believer. Lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the, as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons must be... <clears throat> Excuse me. Deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also be first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be to the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Yeshua Messiah. These things I write to you, though I hope to, to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I, I write so that you may know that <clears throat> know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of El, which is in the church of the living Elohim, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Elohim was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed in the world, received up to glory. And then Leviticus chapter number 10. Leviticus 10, starting in verse number 8. Then Jehovah spoke to Aharon, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you or your sons with you. When you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that you may distinguish between holy and holy, and between unclean and clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which Jehovah has spoken to them by the hand of Moshe. So that was the priestly duties that the Levites, Aharon and his sons, when they went into the tabernacle, they have the same requirements as, as pastors, teachers, and leaders. Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. <clears throat> Offerings that come in need to go to the people of the congregation to go to help the people. If a person has a need, take it to the pastor. Okay, I have this need. And then the leaders of the church will come together. They have a need, meet the need. And then to help out the widows and the orphans, whatever bills come in. But remember, this is Yah's ministry. This is Yehovah's ministry. This is not man's ministry. This is not Daniel Brown ministry. This is not um, Paul Rohe ministry or Anthony Avalos ministry. This is Yehovah's ministry. And everything that comes in needs to go to the congregation, needs to go to pay the bills, needs to keep Yah's work going. If there is a need, a leader and a shepherd, yes, they, ask, they, they go to the shepherd and the leaders of the church ask for help. And then that leads me into the next part, stealing from Yehovah. When people, like Miss Karen said, when you do not tithe, most Christian, Christian churches, religious churches preach that the law has been done away with, but yet they're like, gimme, 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 I want your money. I want your money, I want all of it. Gimme your money. But wasn't the offering and the tithe part of the law? 
So if the law has been done away with, they don't need to be asking for money. Let's turn to Malachi chapter number 3, reading in verse number 8. Will a man rob Elohim? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says Jehovah Zvayot, the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing, that there will be not enough room to receive it. Now, I found this article that's going... Um, I said that religion teaches that the law has been done away with, but yet they want their money. Most Messianic congregations, they will teach that the offerings and the tithes have been done away with. <clears throat> yes, we do not have a tabernacle, we do not have a temple, we do not have an earthly priest, and we're not in Jerusalem to where we're able to give our tithes. But there is something that is called a free will offering. <clears throat> And I'm going to give the definition of it. And there's a lot of scripture that I have written down here that I don't have up here. So if you got a pen and piece of paper, um, and I can put the link to this um, website that I have that I'm reading right now um, up after I'm done preaching. But what is a free will offering? The free will offering or free will offering was a sacrifice regulated by Elohim's standard in the Mosaic law, but it was completely voluntary. Leviticus 23, 38. In the law, the free will offering was to be of a male bull, sheep, or goat with no physical deformities or blemishes, and it was not to have been purchased from a foreigner. Leviticus 22, 17 through 25. The offering was to include flour mixed with oil and wine. The amounts varied on whether the sacrifice was a lamb, bull, or ram. Numbers 15, verses 1 through 10. As with all sacrifices, this free will offering was to be made in a place of Elohim's choosing, not in an area formally used by other religions or at home. Deuteronomy 12. Although it was appropriate to give the sacrifice during formal feast days, it could be given any time, Deuteronomy 16.10. Unlike other offerings governed by stricter rules, the priest could eat the free will offering on the day it was sacrificed or on the day after, Leviticus 7.16-18. Free will offerings did not always have to be animals or grain or even drink offerings. The first time a free will offering was mentioned in the Bible is Exodus 35, 10 through 29. Elohim has, had given instructions on how to build the tabernacle, and, and Moshe relayed what supplies were needed for its construction. The people responded as their hearts stirred them, as they, as they had purposed, purposed in their hearts. Mishpaha. Uh, bringing jewelry, fine yarn, tanned skins, silver, bronze, acacia wood, oink stones, spices, and oil. Onyx, sorry. Onyx stones, spices, and oil. These items were all donated as a free will offering to Yehovah. Exodus thirty-five twenty-nine. Centuries later, the people made similar offerings for David to pass on to Solomon to build the temple. 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. In the book of Ezra, the people gave traditional animal offerings, Ezra 3, 5, as well as supplies to rebuild the temple after the Babylonian captivity, Ezra 2, verse 68, Ezra 7, verse 16, and Ezra 8, verse 28. The people also made animal offerings in 2 Chronicles 31 when King Hezekiah, one of Yehuda's best kings, led the nation in returning to Elohim and reinstituting his ceremonies. In Ezekiel 46.12, free will offerings are mentioned as being offered in the millennial kingdom. 
Whether it was the sacrifice of an animal or donated supplies for a place of worship, the free will offering was to be given freely. As the Adon moved the Israelites' the Israelites hearts, it was not to be used to gain prestige. Unlike most pastors and teachers and preachers today, they want to gain prestige. They want to build their own kingdom. It's not to be gained for prestige, Amos 4, 5, or because of guilt, inducement, or force. Today, the free will offering is the only offering we have. There is no tithe demanded on the church. We rely on the sacrifice of Yeshua and not the sacrifice of animals for our atonement of sin. All the money, time, and resources we give are to be freely given as the Spirit leads us to. The trick for many is noticing and obeying when the Spirit leads. Elohim has given us everything we have, Matthew chapter number 6. If He moves our hearts, Exodus 35, 29, then we should cheerfully give. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. And let's go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians 9, because I have that one written down. So does that clear a lot of things up? Amen. Second Corinthians nine verses one through 15. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you for I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians that Archaea was set was ready a year ago and your zeal has stirred up the majority yet i have sent to the brethren lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect that as i said you may be ready lest if some macedonians come with me and find you unprepared we not to mention you <clears throat> should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to extort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gifts beforehand, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not a grudging obligation. <clears throat> but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows, bount sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one that give, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for Elohim loves a cheerful giver. And Elohim is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us toward to L. For this administration of this service not only supplies the needs of, of his people, of, his, of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to Elohim. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify Elohim for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Messiah and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayers for you who long for you because of the exceeding grace of Elohim in you. Thanks be to Elohim for his indescribable gift. Now, I'm an old farmer. I farmed for 25 years in Nebraska, Wyoming, and Kansas. And every year we had to plant corn, we had to plant wheat, we had to plant triticale. So we would get a crop in the summer and in the fall. And some fields required 25,000 seeds per acre. Some of them got 35,000 seeds per acre. But every seed that we sowed produced, produced some type of grain. Now those fields that only, only got 25,000 seeds per acre, guess what? We didn't get as many bushels off of them acres as we did when we planted fields that had 35,000 seeds per acre. The same thing goes when you give to Yah. 
When you give to Yah cheerfully, right off the top of your paycheck, you will please Yah and be a cheerful giver. Laugh all the way to the offering box. Be a cheerful giver. Yah doesn't want us to do, oh, I got to give to Yah today. I, I got to do my due diligence. He don't want that. He wants you to keep your money if you're going to do that. He wants you to be a cheerful giver. Give right off the top. Don't give what's left over. I guarantee if you give Yah right off the top, you will have enough money at the end of each and every paycheck to meet each and every bill and still put food on the table. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Now I looked up that word superfluous. And uh, it is G4053, over and above, more than necessary. Paul, in chapter 9, verse number 1, he needed to go over and above. He needed to tell people over and over to give. Sometimes we need to hear it. When money's tight, job's not going so well, you're in between jobs, you don't know if you're going to make rent, you don't know if you're going to be able to put food on the table, what's more important, serving Yah or meeting your needs? If you serve Yah first and you, and you give back to Yah what His due diligence is, He will supply your each and every need. And remember, this is Yah's ministry. It's not man's work. You've got to trust in Yah for everything. <clears throat> and most folks say, um, coming out of religion, I've even had, a, had an old Baptist preacher tell me when I told him that we were going in the way of Torah, he's like, he's like, oh, I guess you're going to stop tithing now, aren't you? You're going to stop giving your money. No. I'm going to give back to Yah what he rightfully deserves. I'm going to give him my first fruits because he deserves it. But most people have that are coming out of religion or are stuck in religion that think that are going back to Torah. Oh, you're not going to give your money anymore because that's all been done away with. You don't have to give your money, but yes, you do. We still have the free will offering to give back to Yehovah. Now, let me ask you this. If you don't give to Yehovah, you're stealing to him. You're stealing from him. And you're putting it back in your own pocket. And I promise you, Yah will get his money one way or another. I promise you that. Whether it's in sickness, car breakdowns, jobs. Um, huh? Your house. If you own your own house, even if you rent it. Rent will go up. Utilities will go up. If you steal from Yah, he'll get his money from you. But if you steal from Yah and you don't give back. Huh? Huh? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Miss Karen. I was just saying that's all by idolatry. Yes. You're making yourself your own God and you're keeping it for yourself. That's a very good point. I didn't think of that. Sorry, I was looking over you and... Yes, brother. One thing you need to understand, it's all yours. Yeah. Yep. None of it belongs to us. It's all his. Yep. He's only asking for a small portion. It's right there. You beat me to it. But that's okay. Um, Brother Robert um, said that it's all Yah's, and I agree 100%. Every dollar that he allows you to make, whether it's from Social Security, from retirement, from your job, wherever the money comes from, it's all Yah's to begin with. He has given you the opportunity to receive it. <coughs> People have a lack of faith. Oh, I got to hang on to this just for an emergency instead of being a cheerful giver. And, and I'm just as guilty of it as the next person. I got to hang on to this. I can't let it go. I got to save this for an emergency. But if you're not giving on a regular basis and giving faithfully to Yehovah, you're stealing from him. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Matthew 28, 19, let's start in verse number 18. And Yeshua came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on in earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. If you steal from Yah and you don't give back to him, how is Yah's ministry supposed to go onward and upward. How are Yah's ministers supposed to go out into the world 
and teach and preach all nations to observe his commandments, to bring them into the family of Yehovah. They can't. You're stealing from Yah and you're stealing from people. You're stealing the truth from people. Once again, Matthew 6, 24 through 34. You're stealing from Yah when you don't cheerfully give to him, to his ministry, and you're stealing the truth from people, hindering his work to be done. Philippians 4, 19. My Yah shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Once again, I know I'm repeating myself because it was brought up earlier. When you honor Yah and when you give to him, he will provide all your needs. You won't have a $500,000 house. You won't have a $100,000 car. You won't have a 15-bedroom house. You won't have the fanciest things. But if your car makes it from A to B, and you have a dry, if you have a roof over your head that keeps you dry, keeps you warm, keeps you cool, and you have a bed to lay your head down on, you got your food, your shelter, your clothing, and your medicine, you have everything that you need. Give all of your increase right off the top. Don't give him what's left. Give joyfully. Laugh all the way. <clears throat> I've heard people tell me that, well, I can't afford to give. Money's just too tight. Well, I tell people that I can't afford not to give because I serve the Creator and He provides my every need, just like Brother Robert said. Everything is His in the fullness thereof. <clears throat> Um, an example, early, early on in our marriage, um, we chose to give sparingly. I'd throw a 20 in the plate here and there. I'd throw a 10. I'd give Yah what was left over. And uh, Yah, got his, Yah got his portion. My wife got sick. We had doctor bills. She had heart problems. We had vehicle problems. The list went on and on and on. Like Miss Karen said, I made myself my own God. I wanted to keep that money. Don't rob Yah. <clears throat> and ever since we have been given faithfully to Yah's ministry, to Yah's work, the blessings, not only um, physical blessings, but spiritual blessings of knowing His Word. Um, Yah has opened up His Word to us. He has called us out of religion. He's called us out of this world. And He has opened up His truth to us. And that is the biggest blessing right there. <clears throat> when you rob Yah, <clears throat> you rob yourself of physical and spiritual blessings. And uh, I've said this for quite a few number of years that uh, some people are going to probably not like me after this. But if Yah don't have your checkbook, he don't have your heart. Think about that. Where's your heart at, Mishbaha? Are you giving cheerfully or are you giving begrudgingly? Are you grudging and pouting the whole way to the box? I got to give this week. It's my, it's my pay period. What are you? Cheerfully? Cheerfully or grudgingly? Matthew 6, 21. <laughs> For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When Yah starts blessing you for your faithfulness, don't set your heart on those riches because just as fast as you got them, they can be gone. Psalms chapter number 62, verse 10. Psalm 62, 10. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches, if riches increase, do not set your heart on them. An example of this was uh, I knew a man growing up who had three different businesses. He had a huge farm. He had his own um, business and he had a trucking company and he had a family. Yah had blessed him above and beyond measure, had given him everything. He had nice vehicles. He had a good family. His business was very successful. Even through the bad years of farming, Yah always blessed him for his faithfulness. And then things started getting a little shaky. He started going away from Yah. And his offerings started going by the wayside as well. He didn't trust in Yah. 
and he ended up losing his trucking company. He had 10, 10 truck, nine, 10 trucks. He lost his farming operation twice. Yah took the land, Yah took the equipment, Yah took everything. He lost his family. He lost his wife. He lost his business. Just as fast as he got him, Yah took everything away from him. Just like that. When you rob Yah, once again, you're robbing yourself. Do not set your heart on those riches because the Bible says you brought nothing into this world, you can take nothing out. Another example of this when people stole from Yah is Acts chapter number 5. Let's turn there, verses 1 through 16. <coughs> but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds. Did you hear that? He kept part back. And he kept part back of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it. So she knew about it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it rem remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Have you not lied to man? You have not lied to men, but to Yah. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men ro arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is that you have agreed together <clears throat> to test the spirit of the Adon? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Verse number 12. And through the hands, <clears throat> through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none of the rest, <clears throat> none of the rest, yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly, uh, and believers were increasingly added to the Adon, multitudes of, of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out in the streets and laid on and laid them on the beds and couches that at least that at least the shadow of Peter passing might fall upon them also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits and they were all healed verses 1 through 11 the fear of Yah is there any fear of Yah today when you rob Yah, when you hold back what Yah has so graciously given to you. If that's not a testimony in scripture right there to get you to be more in line in obedience to the word of Yah, then I don't know what is. I tremble when I read that because I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want to steal from Yah. I don't want to steal what is rightfully his. <clears throat> They lied and they stole. Yah owns it all. And Yah gives to us or he allows us to have it. He created it all. Everything you see is Yah's in the fullness thereof. Nothing is ours. We're just borrowing it from him. <coughs> One more way that we rob Yah is we rob of his time on his set-apart day. 
We rob him time on his Sabbath. Isaiah 58, verse 13. I preached on this a few months ago about Sabbath, but it, it's good to touch on it again. Isaiah 58, 13. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of Jehovah honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, and nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. May our words be Yah's words on his set-apart time. May our pleasure be here observing his set-apart day, not going out and playing football, not playing sports, not going fishing, not going hunting, not doing our own thing, not working. Trust in Yah. Honor his day. Don't rob time from him. Also in Exodus 16, 23. <clears throat> uh, Exodus 16, 23. Then he said to them, This is what Jehovah has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to Jehovah. Bake what you will bake today, and boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. Don't cook, don't boil, don't do anything on Shabbat. He tells us in Exodus 16, 23, do it on the day of preparation. Do it on Friday. Honor his Shabbat. Don't cook, don't steal time away from him by having to cook. And don't buy, sell, and trade. And don't cause others to work. Exodus 20.10. Turned right there. Um, Exodus 20.10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day to Jehovah your El. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, Jehovah blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He consecrated it. He set it apart holy for him in Exodus 31, verses 12 through 17. And Jehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath shall you shall keep, for it is signed between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, Yehovah, is who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. Maybe not instantly, but eventually. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among the people. Work shall be done six days, but the seventh is a Sabbath of rest, holy to Yehovah. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. How long is forever? Forever. forever. There you go. I got the right answer. Great. There you're listening. Amen. For in, uh, for in six days, Jehovah made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and he was refreshed. When we observe Sabbath like we're supposed to, how do we feel afterwards? I'm ready for next Sabbath. When's it going to be here? Right? Amen? Amen. Let our time be all about him. Let our words be all about him. Everything, every thought. Let's get to that point, Mishpaha. Every thought, every word that we say, let it all be about him. We have six days. Six days to do what we want to do within, <clears throat> excuse me, within reason according to the word of Yah. But on his set apart day, he asked, it's simple instructions. I can do all things through Messiah, which strengthens me. Philippians 4.13, that's not up there. Yes, it is. It is? Yes. Okay. Oops, <laughs> maybe it is. Um, he asked for 24 hours. Put away the things of the world. Put away your own conversations. Give him complete and full obedience to him and to his word. Stop, stop stealing time from him on his day. What about his feast days? Those are Sabbaths too. Yeah, and on his feast days. 
the the seven bit the seven feasts that he has created in Leviticus 23 outside of the weekly Sabbath honor those feasts honor those set apart times as well and when you do you will be a blessing it'll be a blessing to you but you'll make Yah's face shine upon you if you do it his way and only his way not your own way but his way <clears throat> When you steal time from Yah, that leads me to the physical part of what uh, um, Sean was saying, stealing time from your employer. Deuteronomy 24, verses 14 through 15. <coughs> Deuteronomy 24, 14. You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or one of the aliens who is in the land within your gates. Each day you shall give him his wages and not let the sun go down on it, for he is poor and has set his heart on it, lest he cry out against to you to Jehovah and, make, and it be sin to you. <clears throat> this is talking about employers who steal money from employees. Um, now in this, in this regard, um, back where we came from in Kansas, I knew of some Sabbath keepers who had, who had jobs, but yet they would still work when Sabbath started, but they would shut off their time because they knew that they were not supposed to, um, make money on Shabbat. So their employers would take advantage of them and work them as late as they could into Sabbath. And they would steal their labor from them for free because they knew their convictions according to the word of Yah. They would not, the employees would not charge their employers, but yet their employers would take advantage of that. Now Leviticus 19 verses 11, through 11 and 13. To me, that's wrong. Period. If you work, a, if you work a, a day, get paid a fair day's wages. Leviticus 19, verse number 11. You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another, and you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane, profane the name of your El, for I am Jehovah. You shall not cheat your neighbor or rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. There it is right there, your answer, according to the word of Yehovah. Also in James chapter 5, clear at the other end of the book. James chapter 5, verse number 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. And their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who moved your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the weepers, reapers have reached the ears of the Adon of Sabadoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. <clears throat> Big corporations steal money from the laborers who do the dirty work. I work for a big corporation. Sean here works for the same corporation I do. We get paid decent wages, but I'm sure we could get paid better because the presidents, the owners of the companies are probably getting paid 20, 30 times as much, more than what we are. Is that a fair day's wage? Keep everybody the same. Everybody needs to do a fair day's wages. Employers need to quit robbing from their employees. Those who work, those who move the fields, those who are poor, those who are needy, those who have need, 
need that. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Any questions so far? Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse number 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Adon, whom you seek, will suddenly come to this temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says Jehovah Zvaot. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who will stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi. He will purge them as, sil as gold and silver, that they may offer to Jehovah an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Yehuda in Jerusalem will be pleasant to Jehovah, as in the days of old, as in former years, and I will come near for your judgment. I will be swift, a swift witness against scorners, adulterers, perjurers, and those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and those and against those who turn away the alien, because they do not fear me, says Jehovah Zveo. He will come against those who exploit the wage earners and widows and orphans. Now, employees. We talked about the employees. Let's talk about the ones who are getting the wages. If you have a job, you work for someone else. Like, like Sean said, don't steal time from them. Be honest. Remember, everything that you say and everything that you do, it needs to be done for Yehovah. You honor him before you honor man. Yah has given you this job to provide, whether it's for yourself, for your family, for a local ministry, whatever it is. Don't stand around and talk. Don't be on your phone. I see so many people where I work just standing there. Just standing there for hours on their phones, not doing anything. That's stealing time from them. That's stealing time from you yeah, That's stealing time from your employee, and you're not getting any work done. <clears throat> and then guess what? Everybody else has to pick up the time, has to pick up your workload. Whether you're on hourly or salary, you receive wages. Yah has given you that job to provide. Nothing more and nothing less. A fair day's labor, or a fair day's wages for a fair day's labor. <clears throat> All right, enough of that. Let's move on to something a little bit more um, weighty. Diverse weights. Deuteronomy 25, verses 13 through 16. Deuteronomy 25, verse number 13. You shall not have in your bag differing weights, a heavy and a light. You shall not have your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land which Jehovah your El has given you. For all who do such things, all who behave unrighteously are an abomination to Jehovah your El. Does anybody know what this means? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think we could take it, you know, superficially, like when we're dealing with monies and the money amounts, we could say different prices for different people for things we sell or buy. But I think that there's also a emotional, spiritual aspect of this too. We can't judge another person, person by one standard and have another. So an example of that would be from a parental perspective. There can't be a standard for my children, meaning I make excuse or justification for them, but yet I expect my girlfriend down the street to have, be more just and fair than even I'm willing. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's yeah. right. Yep. <clears throat> what she was saying is, um, those who weren't able to hear, um, when you're dealing financially, um, buying and selling stuff between people, Make sure you have a just weight. Don't say one price for this person over here and another price for this person over here. 
And then from a spiritual aspect, um, your kids, your family, don't hold somebody else's kids to one standard while you're holding this standard over here for your kids or vice versa. Now, uh, verse number verse number 16, abomination. Does anybody know what the word abomination means? Um, remember, it means almost like to throw up. Like vanity? Not, not quite vanity. To throw up, yes. The Hebrew is H8441. It is disgusting. It is wickedness. Yah abhors it. It's sin. He detests it. He hates it. Now let's turn to the book of Proverbs. Give you guys a few verses of scripture here. Proverbs 11.1. 1. Dishonest scales are an abomination to Yehovah. But a just weight is his delight. Proverbs 16.11 Honest weights and scales are Yehovah's. All the weights in the bag are his work. And uh, Proverbs 20.10 And verse number 23. 2010 says diverse weights and diverse measures they are both alike an abomination to Yehovah in verse 23 diverse weights are an abomination to Yehovah and dishonest scales are not good Yah hates it let's see what happens when people use diverse weights Amos chapter number 8 <clears throat> Amos chapter 8 Read verses 1 through 10. Thus, thus the dawn Jehovah showed me. Behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he says, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then Jehovah said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore, and the songs of the temple shall be wailing in the day, says the Adon Yehovah. Many dead bodies everywhere, they shall be thrown out in silence. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, When, when, we, when will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain, and the, sa and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat? making an ephah small and a shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. Yehovah has sworn by the pride of Yaakov, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall, shall the land not tremble for this, and everyone mourn who dwells in it? All of it shall swell like the river, heave and subdue like the river of Egypt. What Basically what they're saying is old grain, old wheat, they want to get more money for it. And they want to oppress the, the widows and the poor. False balances, diverse weights are unjust. Buying and selling, be honest in all of your dealings. <clears throat> now, the contractors that I know... Um, they're very good. Um, I've heard and I've seen and I have been part of contractors who get discounts on all of their materials to fix up houses. And they get some very, very, very good material for next to nothing. And um, contractors only have to pay for half of it. Let's say a, a board of wood is ten dollars they only pay five for it a gallon of paint of good paint sixty bucks they only pay thirty dollars for it they call it profit margin Yah calls it an abomination why not extend those um, sales to your customers honor Yah before you honor man if you get a gallon of paint for thirty dollars why charge them sixty Make it cheaper for your customer. 
Yah will bless you with more work to do. If you are honest in all of your ways, Yah will bless you. Um, the company I work for, um, we sell food to thousands of businesses. I mean, this is a huge warehouse where we store food. And uh, the big wigs up in the big offices, they get it at cost. They get it for a third of the money of what they sell it for. They sell it to, they, they get it for, let's say, $10 a pound, and they sell it to restaurants for $30 a pound. They call it a profit margin. Yah calls it an abomination. Well, we have to make money. Well, yeah, you have to make money, but if you're honest in all of your dealings, Yah will bless you with more business than what you can handle. That's why everything is so, is so expensive. I'll get to you in a second. That's why everything is so expensive. It's because everybody wants their cut. Everybody wants money. Money, money, money. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Once again, Yah hates it. Yes, ma'am. Um, in diverse ways, we also yeah. Rich, poor, homeless, not homeless, yep. um, beautiful, or ugly. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, we need to treat everybody the same. Same love inside. Where's that verse of scripture in the New Testament that talks about the poor man who comes in? Or is that in Proverbs? Not about the poor man that comes, huh? New Testament. Is that. The, but the poor man comes in and you say, oh, you sit back over here. But the rich man comes in all prestige in a nice suit. Oh, sit down in front. That's Luke 14, Puppy. Is that Luke 14? Let's turn to Luke 14 and see if I can find it. Where the poor man sits at the table? Yeah. Well, For the feast? Is that what you want? No, not that one. Everybody knows which one I'm talking about. Uh, it's 14 about the one being invited to the feast, but I'm talking about the one that comes in, the homeless that comes off the streets. The honor place, verse 7. In Luke 14? Luke 14, verse... Okay, verse number 7. So let's turn to Luke 14, 7. Thank you, everyone. So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man, and then you will be begin with and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he c invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher, then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted." That's not the exact one that I wanted, but it'll, it'll do. Those who come in, the poor, the needy, the widow, the orphan, don't despise them. Don't, don't choose the rich man. The, for the rich man has many friends, but the poor don't have nobody. Choose the poor, too, because they have a soul. They have a purpose, and Yah has a plan for them as well. Proverbs chapter number 1, verse number 19. Proverbs 1, 19. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy of gain. It takes away the life of its owners. To me, it seems like that people can never have enough money. They will do whatever they can. They will seek, they will kill, and they will destroy just to get that next dollar. But being content with what you have is much better. You don't need materialistic things to be happy. You need Yah. You need his love to be happy. Let's turn to Psalms 37, 16. This was something that my wife was studying out this morning that goes right alongside with my sermon today. Psalm 37, 16. Yah gave me uh, Psalm 37 about six years ago when I was going through a rough, rough time and absolutely love 
chapter 37 in the book of Psalms. But let's read verse number 16. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Proverbs 28, verse 6. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one perverse in his ways, though he be rich. Proverbs 16, 8. Proverbs 16, 8 says, Better is a little with righteousness than vast revenues without justice. And then Proverbs 15, 16. Better is a little with the fear of Yehovah than great treasure with trouble. Little bit. If you just have a little, be content with just a little. You don't have to be rich. You can't take it with you when you go. Proverbs chapter number 10, verses 2 through 4. A wise son makes a glad father, but the foolish son is the grief to his mother. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivers from death. Yehovah will not allow the righteous soul to famish, but he casts away the desire of the wicked. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent he makes rich. Be busy in what you do. Don't steal time. Don't steal money. Get everything that you have by working for it. That's what I was always taught growing up. Don't steal. Don't steal money from nobody. Work for everything that you have. That is one thing that my dad taught me is a great work ethic. Work for everything that you have. Don't be lazy. Don't be slothful. <clears throat> now, if you, have, if you have stolen in the past, I want to talk about restoring a little bit. Exodus chapter number 22. Exodus chapter number 22, starting in verse number 1. <clears throat> if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun has ridden, risen on him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He should, he should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the theft is certain, certainly found alive in his hand, whether it be an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he, has to, he shall restore double. If a man causes a field or a vineyard to be grazed, and lets loose his animal, and he feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. If a fire breaks out and cat, ca catches in thorns so that it is stacked grain, standing grain, or in the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. If a man delivers to his neighbor money for articles to keep, and it is stolen out of that man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, then he shall, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has put in his hand into his neighbor's goods. For any kind of trespass, whether it concerns an ox, donkey, sheep, or clothing, or any other kind of lost thing which another claims to be his, the cause, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whomever the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. If a man delivers to his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or an animal to keep, and it dies, is hurt, or driven away, no one seeing it, then the oath of Jehovah shall be between them both, that he has not put his hand to his neighbor's goods, and the owner of it shall accept that, and he shall not make it good. But if, in fact, it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to the owner of it. If it is torn to pieces by a beast, then he shall bring it as evidence, and he shall not make good what is torn." If a man borrows anything from his neighbor and it becomes injured or dies, the owner of it, 
the owner of it not being with it, he shall surely make it good. If the owner was with it, he shall not make it good if it was hired, if it came for his, its hire. In Leviticus 6, verses 1 through 7. Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, If a person sins and commits a trespass against Yehovah by lying to his neighbor about what was delivered to him for safekeeping, or about a pledge, or about a robbery, or if he has extorted from his neighbor, or if he has found what is lost and lies concerning it and swears falsely in any one of these things that a man may do in which he sins, then it shall be because he has sinned and is guilty that he shall restore what he has stolen or the thing which he has extorted or what was delivered to him for safekeeping or the lost thing which he has found or all that about which he has sworn falsely he shall restore to its full value. Add one fifth more to it and give it to whomever it belongs on the day of the trespass offering. And he shall bring his trespass offering to Yehovah, a ram without blemish from the flock, with your valuation as a trespass offering to the priest. So the priest shall make atonement for him before Yehovah, and he shall be forgiven for any one of these things that he may have done in which the trespass. <clears throat> Regard, okay. When you take, when you borrow, when you steal, According to the Torah, it is to be restored back to the owners, sometimes doubled, sometimes five times, sometimes four times. It depending, it, de it all depends on the situation. Regardless, restitution must be made. Now, when I was little, I stole some stuff. I stole some balloons from, I know it was silly, but I was about five to six years old, we were in the grocery store, and I stole a little packet of balloons. I wanted the balloons, and my mom and my mom said I couldn't have them. So I stole them. I took them home. And my dad found out that I did. He saw me running with them. He asked me where I got them. And I told him I took them. Well, did mama pay for them? No. I had to go back to the store, and I had to face what I had done. I went up to the manager of the store that was on duty that day and I said, I stole these balloons from you and I was shaking in my boots. And I had to answer for what I did right then and there. I returned the balloons, I apologized, he accepted my apologies and I had to work for those balloons and I had to pay back what I had taken and give the balloons back. I was taught to man up, to take responsibility for all of my actions, no matter what they were, and to make everything right. Not in the sight of men, because what men thinks is right is wrong, but it matters what Yah thinks and what the word of Yehovah says. I don't have to answer to man. I have to answer to Yah first, and his laws out override man's laws all the time. Now to conclude, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verses 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of Elohim? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Verse number 11, listen up. And such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Adon Yeshua and by the spirit of our Elohim. In Ephesians 4, starting in verse number 17, reading all the way to the end. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Adon, <coughs> that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, 
in the few futility of their minds, thank you, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of El because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. You have not so learned Messiah, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as it as the truth is in Yeshua, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to Elohim in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, put away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another." Be angry and sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of Elohim, by whom you were sealed in the, for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be, be kind-hearted one to another, forgiving one another, even as Elohim and Messiah has forgiven you. We have been washed. We have been cleaned. We have been made whole. Let it not be named among any one of us anymore. Let us all walk worthy of our calling from the Father and our Savior, Ye Ye Savior Yehovah Yeshua, uprightly, justly, showing the world who we belong to, the Creator. Remember, we might be the only Bible that people ever read. Shabbat Shalom, Shavua Tov, have a blessed and wonderful week.